you, I'll you get it. I'm, I promise I, you. I'm, uh, that's the benefit back. of being you'll the chairman. I'm going to get them. I'm going to get, right, get back to it. You're the Thank chairman. You. So, all right, no problem. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kamen, um, see, I know that the American Legion has indicated their support for the, the TAP bill, H.R. Uh, 5649, but I want to get your perspective and insight on this, uh, again, very important bill. How can we work with DOD to ensure that service members are able to attend the TAP whenever they want throughout their program, uh, their military careers? There's language in the bill that allows this, I understand, but how can we in ensure that service members are allowed to attend the classes uh, during their military career? And then also, if they want to attend the classes, uh, maybe the same classes over again. Uh, so I think that's so very important that they have the flexibility. Uh, if you can answer that question, I'd appreciate it. Yes, thank you, sir, for that question. And you're right, it is an important issue when it comes to structuring TAP to meet the demands of the service member and not the other way around. Um, right. The biggest challenge, I think, with TAP we see is an edifice that's developing around uh, languages that often references the military life cycle model and that we need TAP over the course of a life cycle for service members. And while that sounds nice, it is very tough to imagine how that impacts the ground level soldiers, Marines, uh, and sailors. We're in the middle of theater deployments, the middle of uh, extended training. Um, you have to, you will get introduced with TAP. Who's gonna do that? Our TAP counselors gonna be coming, going out to the field with them? I have yet to see any integration when it comes to TAP counselors and service members on the ground and on the company level. That being said, the bill does make an important step when it comes to the one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, there is a litany of evidence that suggests that mentorship uh, is much more, can be much more critical than just a class. A class is passive learning. Mentorship, you're engaging. So by meeting with the TAP counselor one-on-one -on -one beforehand, they can come to better understanding about what they, what right path they want to take, and if they have any concerns or questions, uh, that can be answered and before going into TAP. I've often referenced a story about a Marine who told me that one of his, uh, he was a company commander, one of his Marines wanted to go to college, and he was really excited he was gonna get out in a, in a month, and the problem was it was February, and his commander asked him, well, have you applied? Because usually the deadlines are around, uh, you know, November or December and the Marine's face turned white as a ghost because he, he had no idea. And that's how service members can end up going to unscrupulous institutions who say, oh, we'll enroll you, don't worry about that, we have a rolling admission at our for-profit school. And that makes it that much more important we see from the counseling side that they can get that more in advance so they can structure their separation plan far in advance before that TAP class already happens. Very good, thank you. Uh, Ms. Augustine, uh, please share with us why it is important that we improve service members' transition from active duty to civilian life and how the chairman's TAP bill, uh, again, H.R. 5649, which I strongly support, proposes key changes that will positively impact overall outcomes for individuals separating from the military. If you can go into some detail, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you for that question. A successful transition is important for a number of reasons. The most important being that veterans are the ambassadors of the all-volunteer force, and if we successfully transition veterans into schools, into employment, into whatever their pathways after, after their military service may be, we now have empowered individuals who are speaking to the benefits of service that can have prolonged impacts on the positive, positive ability to continue sustaining the all-volunteer force. It also, it fulfills our obligation to those who serve to make sure that because because of their service, we afford them the opportunity for an education employment pathways that speak to the level of importance of their service. Um, those two are probably the, the most important reasons why we support the TAP bill and want to see the TAP program continue to be strengthened and improved. Okay, very good. And uh, I wouldn't mind meeting with you uh, in my office to get some further suggestions on how we can improve it, because this is something that's very important to me and to my constituents, and I have uh, a veterans advisory uh, group, and we've been working on this issue for the last year. So uh, please don't hesitate to, to come and see me, please. Thank I will you. do, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilirakis, and I appreciate all the groundwork that you laid in advance of this uh, TAP reform legislation. 
uh, it's, ma it's made it all, all the more efficient to move through the process to get to where it is today. I'm very proud of it because I, I really, you know, it's, it's, it's very much a sort of West Texas uh, principle that, you know, you, you wouldn't ask something from somebody, especially something so great as to be willing to sacrifice your life on the front end and make sure that they had the support to do what you're asking them on the front end and then just kind of when they're when you've gotten what you want out of them what you needed out of them you just kind of thanks and send them off along their way I, I think that's not a just West Texas principle that's not American that's not that's just as my B law professor used to say at Texas Tech that ain't right the ain't right meter is way over here on that one and and so let's and I'm not under any illusion that this is the uh, silver bullet, uh, the, uh, you know, that will solve all the problems that our veterans face when, when they return home uh, with respect to incarceration and unemployment and, and suicide and addiction. But to get at those things earlier, to, to have a profile after an assessment that's meaningful, it's real assessment, and we do it again early enough that we can begin to wrap around the, the, the services that, and support that they need. Not a one size fits all, but as we've attempted to do, have individualized plans and identify those who are the highest risk. We know what presents as the highest risk of veterans or service member members transitioning. Let's get ahead of it. Let's care as much about them at that transition stage as we do when we're transitioning them as warriors from citizen to warrior now from warrior to citizen and leverage all those awesome new skills and training that they have so they'll be even better than they would have been had they not had that experience in the uh, in their communities and in the workforce uh, so I, I obviously I've it's taken me a year uh, Mr. Bilirakis, but I've finally found the thing that I think will make the greatest difference in my tenure. If I'm chair for just one Congress, this is that thing. I think the 9-11, post 9-11 GI Bill is working wonderfully. I mean, we can always make tweaks to it, but I mean, the home loan program, I mean, it works well. This, this needed uh, vast improvement. I think we've created some vast or structural uh, transformational uh, improvements. Now, I understand, Ms. Devlin, and I really enjoyed working with you.